Before I begin, be sure to like the video and leave a comment on what you think of it. Also, be sure to subscribe to my channel and ring the bell to keep up with further audiobook readings. Chapter 7 Setting Up Your Family Bank and Cash Flow Insurance the Right Way the Rockefellers used a network of trusts and a family office to keep their fortune alive. And today, if your family wealth is in the tens of millions of dollars, then you can hire a Rockefeller-style family office to manage your wealth too. Or there is the Bessemer Trust to manage your family's wealth, as you'll read about in this chapter. But what if you're not ready for the Rockefeller-style family office? Or maybe you just want something more personalized to you and your family's values. What then? If you have cash flow insurance and leave behind a sizable sum of money, how do you protect the family fortune after you're gone? First, a board of trustees can be created to help manage the family wealth if you're not around to do so. This is exactly what Garrett has done for his family trust. A board of trustees is a great way to make sure your family turns out like the Rockefellers rather than the Vanderbilt family. J.D. Roth started a popular website in 2006 called Get Rich Slowly, which Money Magazine once named the web's most inspiring personal finance blog. By publishing his personal finances online, he let the world watch as he paid down $35,000 in customer loans. And he didn't just highlight his successes, he shared his failures too. Like the time years earlier that he inherited $5,000 and spent it on a new computer and video games rather than chipping away at the $20,000 he owed to his credit cards. There's a clear lesson there. Inherited money doesn't change a person's relationship with money, it enhances their relationship. A spender who inherits money is going to spend it. A saver is going to save it. An investor will invest it, and so on. So if you want to implement the Rockefeller method and leave behind generational wealth for your family, how do you protect the wealth from heirs who aren't ready to manage so much money? How do you make sure your descendants have wealth and opportunity, but not the opportunity to throw great Gatsby parties in waterfront mansions? The Rockefellers designed trusts to protect the family wealth. But a trust is a trust because you're giving up legal ownership of assets and entrusting them to someone else. Is it still possible then to maintain some control over the family wealth and make sure it is preserved? Yes, and for Garrett's trust, the answer is to look at the trust like a corporation, complete with a CEO and a board of trustees. Garrett's Trust The CEO and board of trustees for your trust. Today, I am figuratively the CEO of my trust. It's not an actual position, and you won't find me appointed as Chief Executive Officer in my trust documents, but during my lifetime, I will be fulfilling the responsibilities of a traditional CEO for my trust. A CEO typically has three key responsibilities. To establish the company vision, to establish the company culture, and to look after the shareholders' financial interests. And that's exactly what I do for my family trust. I've established the vision by thoroughly writing it down in my statement of purpose. I've established the culture by setting an example for my kids, and one day their kids. And I'm the one adding money to the trust and guiding it for the benefit of my heirs. My trust also states that during my lifetime, I have the power to overrule any withdrawal from the trust. So while the trustees have the legal right to distribute assets from the trust at any time, they can't do it without my approval. At some point, however, I won't be around to personally protect the family trust. What then? Again, we look to the example of a corporation. 
A corporation may have a board of trustees who are bound by company bylaws. These bylaws may give direction on selling the company or what to do in case of a hostile takeover or how to handle misbehavior from someone within the company. If the bylaws don't spell out exactly what to do, the board can vote on what action to take. Well, your trust can have a board of trustees too. And if you choose your board carefully and give them specific instructions when appropriate, your board of trustees can protect the family wealth for you after you're gone. Your board of trustees can vote on when to approve distributions to heirs, when to sell assets or businesses, and how to handle lawsuits against the family. They can even decide to stop giving distributions to an heir who may have a drug, alcohol, or some other problem that would make access to more money destructive. Choosing a board of trustees and a trust protector. Clearly, selecting the people who will protect your family wealth after you're gone is not a matter to be taken lightly. You must think about those that best understand your financial philosophy, who will respect your wishes, and who will best represent the choices you'd make if you were still around to make them. My advice is to start with people who share your values and can teach those values to the next generation. Another way to think about it is if you were to start a company today, who would you partner with or put on the board of directors? You can see the members of my board of trustees here in an actual excerpt from my trust documents. A. Appointment of Initial Trustee I appoint a board of trustees collectively acting together as if they are the trustees as described within this trust. Unless otherwise indicated, the board shall make decisions by a majority vote in number. The board shall consist of the following people. Mo Abdau, Derek Van Ness, Dale Clark, Rich Christensen, and Ryan Oshia. Rich Christensen shall act as the chairman of the board of trustees. There shall always be an odd number of trustees serving on the board of trustees hereunder. I choose this board because each member represents knowledge or a characteristic that I share with them that they can teach to my kids or grandkids if I'm not around to do it. Derek Van Ness can teach living soul purpose and how to run a business in a way that leaves you fulfilled. Rich Christensen is a fantastic example of teaching kids values and how to be a responsible human being. He's also an expert at bootstrapping successful businesses, which he's done dozens of times. Mo Abdau specializes in advancing financial strategies like premium financing and private banking, and has the contacts to help implement the wealth strategies of the wealthy. Dale Clark is fantastic with details and deeply understands my financial philosophy and Ryan Oshia is the rare investment advisor who understands how I feel about investing in 401ks and IRAs full of mutual funds. All five of these men have spent time with my kids and family and understand what we're all about. I chose Rich Christensen to be the chairman of the board of trustees because I believe his personal qualities fit the job requirements and he has experience as chairman of the board with multiple organizations. If I pass away, Rich's responsibilities as chairman will include calling the board together when there's an issue that requires action, making sure appropriate decorum is followed during meetings, guiding decisions in a way that matches my wishes, and making sure all decisions by the board are enacted. But what if my board of trustees despite all the evidence that they will follow my wishes, decides to go rogue and start investing the family wealth in some wild investing scheme I would never have approved. Of course, I'm confident this will never happen, but in case the board votes to do something that would put my trust in jeopardy, I've appointed Andrew L. Howell Esquire as my trust protector. Andrew is not a trustee and doesn't vote on how to manage the trust, 
but he can overrule the board whenever he believes they're not acting in the best interest of the trust. He can also remove and replace trustees who no longer seem to be acting on my wishes for the trust. So by creating a carefully chosen board of trustees and appointing a trust protector, all of whom know me and my financial philosophy extremely well, I can feel confident that my family trust will be managed responsibly even after I'm gone. Through the years, the members of my board of trustees or the trust protector may change, but the philosophy will not. The legacy I leave for my family will carry on. Other wealthy families have utilized the same method employed by the Rockefellers and by Garrett, such as the Phipps family. Henry Phipps grew up in the same neighborhood as Andrew Carnegie. Phipps was known around town for being a shrewd financier. So when Andrew started the Carnegie Steel Company, he made Henry Phipps a business partner. This made Phipps a very wealthy man, as he was the second largest shareholder of Carnegie Steel, one of the richest companies in American history. A believer in philanthropy, just like the Rockefellers, Phipps gave much of his wealth away, but he also believed in leaving a lasting family legacy for his five children and their descendants. And that's why Phipps founded the Bessemer Trust in 1907. The Bessemer Trust was created to be the family office for the Phipps family. Their purpose was to manage the family finances in order for the wealth to last for generations. By all accounts, and six generations later, the Bessemer Trust had succeeded. In fact, Henry Phipps' great-grandson, Stuart S. Janney III, is the current chairman of the board of directors for the Trust. A letter from Henry Phipps to his son, Henry Carnegie Phipps, written shortly after the Trust's foundings, has been immortalized for its wisdom and foresight. Here is the letter reprinted in its entirety. Henry Phipps, 87th Street and 5th Avenue, New York, June 16, 1911. My dear Hal, I have today transferred to your name two million dollars in bonds and two million dollars in stock of the Bessemer Investment Company, which I wish you to regard as a trust from me for the benefit of yourself and your children after you. It is my desire that neither the stock nor the bonds of the company shall pass out of my family and that you will agree among yourselves that the others shall have an opportunity to buy at a fair price the stock and bonds of any one before a different disposition can be made. I hope that the management of the affairs of the company shall meet with approval of each one, but should a difference of opinion arise, I desire that the judgment of a majority of you shall be controlling on all questions of policy. I advise that you approve action by the board of directors of the company in reserving all net profits as additions to surplus account and in declaring no dividend on the stock for at least ten years. I urge upon you to live within your income and not to be a borrower on your own account or through the company. Realizing that changed conditions may arise, which will require freedom in action to meet them, I have not fixed rigid limitations as to possession and control of this property, but have indicated my earnest desire that a prudent and conservative management of the company shall be maintained and enforced and that each of you shall put proper restrictions upon your expenditures and lay aside a reasonable proportion of your income. I have full confidence that this advice will be respected and followed by all of my children. Your affectionate father, Henry Phipps. One slice of insight is Phipps' choice not to include fixed, rigid limitations of the family assets. While the Vanderbilt story shows that giving free reign to family members and allowing them to spend a fortune can be disastrous, there is wisdom in not fixing rigid rules for the future. 
Andrew L. Howell Esquire, Garrett's estate planning attorney, shared a story of a family trust that left money for education, but the family didn't foresee the changes that would take place in education, like the cost of computers, software, fees, or travel. The rigid rules meant some expenses couldn't be paid for. It's impossible to write specific rules for a future you do not know, so there is some wisdom in trusting your heirs to make good decisions utilizing the intellectual legacy you've also left behind. Like so many things, harmony, adaptability, and philosophy are key. At the heart of Garrett's estate plan and the Rockefeller method is insurance. Insurance is a tool, not an investment. If you don't understand the tool, it won't be very helpful. Cash flow insurance is the strategy for maximizing the tool of life insurance. Cash flow insurance doesn't work because of the product. It works because of the strategy through looking cohesively and comprehensively at how things work together. Your overall financial blueprint should guide your financial decisions. Financial planning is not one size fits all, although unfortunately many planners seem to look at it that way. Figure out what your vision and goals are, who you are and what you want to accomplish, and then see how a cash flow insurance policy can play a role. If you look at strategy and integration, whole life insurance makes sense. If you look at it as an individual, isolated product where you merely leave money behind when you die, you miss the power and cash flow that it can unlock. Only one out of every hundred people Michael sees has their policy structured properly, and most don't even know about the Rockefeller method. A cash flow insurance policy can be an amazing tool if you understand and properly utilize it, or it can be dangerously expensive if you don't. The first step when setting up a cash flow insurance account is to pick a company with which to purchase your policy. We've already discussed the difference between mutual and stock companies, so you know to pick a mutual insurance company. Here are some other factors to look at. 1. Ratings. Don't go for any company with less than an A rating across the board. With Moody's, AM Best, Standard and Poor's, etc. Choose a top 10 to 15 mutual insurance company. 2. How old the company is. We would only recommend companies that have been around at least a hundred years. 3. Make sure they pay dividends and that they have a solid history of always paying dividends, including through the World Wars, the Great Depression, and the 2008 financial crisis. 4. Check their current interest rates on the loan provisions and make sure there is a fixed option. You don't want a variable interest rate. 5. Make sure there are no unreasonable charges for withdrawals or fees for borrowing money. 6. Make sure their term insurance rates are competitive and convertible to their whole life policy. 7. Make sure they have a good whole life product or portfolio. And 8. Go for companies that have high early cash value. Make sure there are no fees or expenses for overfunding or overpayment or other obstacles standing in the way of easily overfunding your policy. There are about a dozen or so mutual life insurance companies that fulfill all these requirements. When you are ready to purchase your life insurance, the next step is to determine how much is right for you. The first mistake people make when acquiring insurance is not maximizing coverage. If you want to make cash flow insurance work as quickly as possible, you would get a low amount of insurance coverage and then overfund your policy as much as possible. However, 
Fully protecting your human life value with the proper amount of death benefit should absolutely be your number one priority. It also locks in the opportunity for conversion and increasing your cash flow insurance strategy in the future. Before you even consider cash flow insurance, maximize your insurance protection. Insurance is, first and foremost, a tool to protect your family and to replace your income if something should happen to you. Some people may think a million dollars of life insurance sounds like a large amount, but if you think about never earning another dollar in your life and what the lost income would amount to, a million dollars doesn't sound like so much anymore. As we discussed in the previous chapter, it is essential that you figure out what your human life value is and protect that first, and then figure out what type of policy is best for you. Your human life value includes your character, health, knowledge, experiences, education, judgment, initiative, and ability to produce value for others. Your human life value is the creator of all the physical things that you enjoy, your home, car, clothes, and furniture. All value results from the utilization of property from a human being. Any income you produce and property you own, you have because of your human life value. Protect your human life value, your economic value, and your security through maximization of coverage first. All other considerations come second. There is no way to be overinsured with life insurance. If you have a $10,000 car and insure it for $30,000, it would be overinsured. There would be too much incentive to crash the car. If you have a million dollar home and insure it for 1.5 million, there is exposure to the insurance company. For some people, there would be an incentive to burn into the ground and make half a million dollars. Similarly, insurance companies that are insuring property will not overinsure you. The definition of insurance is the indemnification of a loss or what would be lost in the event that X occurred. They will assess the value of the asset and insure it for that amount or less and no more. But it's hard to overestimate and easy to underestimate the value of your life. Whatever amount of insurance a company will quote you, it will be shortchanging your actual value. Why? because they will base it on a snapshot of where you are now. They won't factor in the fact that your income will likely increase over your lifetime. Insurance companies will usually only give you one times your net worth and 10 times your income if you're near the end of your working life, or 30 times income if you're young and have 30 or more years of work in you. Think of life insurance not as a lump sum of money, but as an income replacement. There is a maximum amount of insurance that a company will issue on your life. Find out what that number is. That is the amount we recommend you acquire. When you own the maximum amount of life insurance, you will know, not just hope, but know that if something happens to you, you cannot possibly do any better for your family. You can go through your daily life with the peace of mind that comes with knowing your loved ones will be taken care of in the best way possible, especially if you combine your insurance with a living trust utilizing the Rockefeller method. Life insurance is a permission slip to live in the abundance mindset because you know that your finances are settled. This peace of mind will allow you to produce at an even higher level than before. This is something we call the security of maximization. Protection leads to production, not just in terms of earning money, but in terms of the quality of your life. That peace of mind will translate into your life, into clarity, joy, and the mental space and creativity that allows you to create and produce more. This higher production and quality of life that awaits you will more than pay for the increased coverage. 
people often think you either have to invest or protect. The good news is, we don't live in a world of either or. We live in a world of abundance. It's possible to have the maximum amount of insurance without hurting your net worth and without hurting your cash flow. When you know how much insurance to get, and only when you know that, then you need to decide what kind of insurance you want. We've already discussed what we believe to be the best kind of insurance, especially for cash flow insurance, overfunded whole life insurance. If your current cash flow doesn't allow for a whole life insurance policy right now, you can buy convertible term insurance in the meantime. Term insurance is a great stopgap for a short period of time. However, if you're going to buy term insurance, make sure the company will allow you to convert it regardless of what happens to your health. Garrett sold insurance from 1998 to 2005. During that time, he had a client to whom he sold a term insurance policy. It was a 10-year policy, and before the client reached the end of it, he was diagnosed with a terminal illness. Thankfully, the term policy could be converted into a permanent policy regardless of his health. Once you've got the right kind of insurance, your insurability is protected no matter what. Of the over 2,000 life insurance carriers in this country, we know of maybe 35 to 40 that have this type of convertible term insurance to the right whole life policy. If you have past health issues, you may be ineligible. Certain companies will give you a policy when you have certain medical conditions, while others will not. Some are more willing to insure certain types of risks. If you cannot get a policy on yourself, you can still open a cash flow insurance policy by taking out life insurance on your spouse, child, parent, or business partner. We both have cash flow insurance policies on our own lives and on the lives of our spouses and our kids. As you can probably already tell, there are many different variables to navigate when setting up your cash flow insurance policy. This navigation is very easy if you have the right person helping you set it up, but it can be a nightmare if you don't. Don't try to set up your cash flow insurance policy by yourself or with just any insurance agent. You wouldn't try to do a root canal on yourself or go to someone that wasn't a dental professional, would you? It's important to have a specialist. Moreover, insurance companies rely on agents as part of the underwriting and design process. Not all policies are equal, not all companies are equal, and not all agents are equal. You can't set up a cash flow insurance policy with just any insurance specialist out there. Finding more than an agent is essential to utilizing your policy, maximizing its results, and coordinating with all the other money decisions you're making. Certified cash flow insurance specialists are trained in the methodology and protocols that minimize commission and maximize cash value and they know how to integrate the strategy that leads to more cash in your pocket and in your plan. Find someone who will look holistically at your entire financial architecture to make sure your cash flow insurance system fits in with your overall strategy, and someone who is actually using these strategies themselves the way that we are describing to you. Plus, a specialist will have the expertise to find money for you to capitalize and fund your cash flow insurance. By saving you on the four I's, IRS, investment fees, insurance costs, and interest, your certified cash flow insurance specialist can help you reclaim cash that can be redirected to building your own banking system. Sometimes, agents are offered bonuses for only using one company. Make sure you're not dealing with an agent who is enslaved to one company. You want someone that is not captive and is able to write through many different companies. Ask to see their personal policies and ask for specific examples. If they have them, they will show you. 
Another thing to watch for is that some companies will penalize agents by lowering the percentage of their commission if the policyholder borrows money from their policies. That's one reason some agents won't recommend this strategy. Now, agents do get commissions on the policies they write, just like mortgage brokers and real estate agents. Agents get commissions on all forms of life insurance. Term life insurance, universal life insurance, and whole life insurance all have fairly similar commission percentages. At most companies, these range anywhere from 40% to 115% of your first year premium, then trailing off as the years pass. Because universal and whole life premiums are higher than term life premiums to start out, the amount of money agents receive is higher, even though the percentage is the same. That's why whole life can get a bad rap for high commissions. Commission rates average at 50 to 55% of the base premium in the first year, and an additional 3 to 9% of the policy with each renewal. Usually, commissions are paid annually to agents. If the policyholder doesn't pay for at least 13 months, the commission gets pulled back from the agent. Agents are incentivized to sell you a product that maximizes their commission, and most agents are not willing to lower their commission so you can have more cash. There are many agents out there who try to mimic or replicate this form of cash flow insurance. The difference is, these agents are often incentivized to set up the policy improperly because they'll get a bigger commission. In fact, a properly designed cash flow insurance policy can make commissions substantially lower. When you overfund a whole life insurance policy, it can actually lower the commissions to agents by up to 50 to 70 percent on every dollar. Why? Because those overfunding dollars are going straight to the cash value rather than toward the base premium with the right companies. So in order to make larger commissions, agents will sell you a policy that is not cash rich in the first two or three years. These policies are fairly common. Many big insurance carriers have policies that have zero dollars of cash value in year one, sometimes even in year two or three. You might be putting ten or twenty thousand dollars a year into this policy with nothing to show for it in those beginning years. Instead of going into your pocket, the commission money is going to the agent. Many popular life insurance policies from the 1990s, 1980s, and earlier would have no cash value in the first year. This is because they were not designed properly. With the cash flow insurance system, we can design policies that become cash rich in their very first year. So cash flow insurance keeps money in your hands instead of it going into the hands of the financial professional selling you the product. Say you buy a $100,000 policy and it costs you $100 a month or $1,200 a year. That $1,200 is your base premium and in the first year the agent who sold you the policy might stand to gain anywhere from $600 to $1,200 50 to 100 percent of commission on that base premium. If, instead of the 1200, you funded the policy with 2400 in the first year, that extra 1200 might only pay 3 percent commission or possibly even zero commission. If you overfund a $100,000 policy instead of bumping up and getting a $200,000 policy, you're going to have a lot more cash in that $100,000 policy. Cash that is not going to commissions, but straight into your plan. This overfunding is done through something called paid up additions. Paid up additions are extra money in overfunding that you are putting into your policy beyond what the policy would require. This money supports in accelerating the growth of the policy so that your internal rate of return is accelerated in the early years of the policy instead of having to wait 10 or 12 years to see a positive yield on your savings or money. 
It's a way of supercharging the cash value of your policy. This not only increases your cash value more quickly, but also grows your death benefit. You can also set up your policy so that at least 50% of the money you put into it in the first year shows up in cash value. Generally, life insurance companies hold on to the entire first year's base premium for 10 years, using that for reserves and guaranteeing your death benefit. The insurance company is also taking into consideration the acquisition cost and marketing fees they pay in the form of commission to the agent and underwriting costs. That's how insurance companies remain profitable and guarantee early death claims. If you put additional cash on top of your base premium, that is cash you can utilize within 30 days of it going into your policy. There are some limits on how much you can overfund your policy. It's not unlimited. Be sure to talk with your certified cash flow insurance specialist on how to properly overfund your policy with paid up additions. If it is done incorrectly, it could negate the tax benefits. If you put too much money into your policy, it becomes what is called a modified endowment contract. MEC for short. Basically, that means you're funding the policy at a level where you pass the corridor of cash value to death benefit and the government treats it more like an annuity than an insurance contract. This is easily avoided with simple calculations and communication. Garrett once made an error on his own policy calculation and overfunded to the point of a modified endowment contract. Fortunately, he was able to take some of the money out immediately and retain his benefits. Overall, the best method is to put as much into your policy as your cash flow will allow. Building to 15% of your income is ideal, but what is most important is just getting started. The great thing about paid up additions is that you can stop them whenever you feel like it. When you reach retirement age, you may decide you don't want to continue to supercharge your policy. Then you can just pay the premium or you can use the cash value that you've stored up in your policy to pay the premium so you don't have to worry about more payments when you're in the distribution phase of your financial life. One of the key philosophies of cash flow insurance is to continue to build and capture wealth. It may never make sense to stop funding your cash flow insurance. If you put in a dollar and more than a dollar shows up, is usable within 30 days, and increases your wealth, you may choose to always fund this and then just use it anytime you like. It's just like making a deposit into a checking, savings, or money market account. You can spend it anytime you want, but you store it somewhere in the meantime. How to find extra money to maximize your policy's cash value. Well, you may be thinking at this point, all of this sounds great, but where do I get the money to do all of this? Where does that cash for the paid up additions come from? Even if you don't have great cash flow right now, the whole idea of cash flow insurance is to help you find that extra money and hold on to it. Right now, you have money that's being lost to financial institutions, taxes, loans, etc. If you can reclaim that money, what we call cash flow optimization or cash recovery, that money can go instead into a cash flow insurance policy that protects and grows your wealth rather than losing it. If you're getting a tax refund every year, it means you are overpaying on your taxes. Or in other words, you're giving the government an interest-free loan over the course of the year. If you increase your exemptions and decrease your tax overpayment, you can use that extra cash to start building your family bank. Instead of reinvesting the interest you're earning on your investments, you can put it into your cash flow insurance policy. In the policy, that money can grow tax-free rather than being taxable. 
We've talked a bit already about the cash flow index and restructuring inefficient loans. Paying off or restructuring inefficient loans is a great way to free up cash flow to put into a cash flow insurance policy. People often think that what matters the most is paying off loans as quickly as possible. Financial gurus like Suze Orman are always saying to shorten your mortgage and other loans. However, if you shorten your mortgage or loans, it forces you into higher payments, which can provide more risk and increase your debt to income, lowering your credit score. This might result in having to pay a higher interest rate on every other loan you have moving forward. Your debt to income ratio is the percentage of every dollar you make that is required to go towards a loan payment, either on principal or interest. Of all the factors that affect your ability to qualify for a loan, debt to income is one of the most impactful. You can use the cash flow index we discussed earlier to determine which loan is the biggest cash hog and will free up your debt to income the fastest. Paying off inefficient loans will help your debt to income, which will help your credit score, which will help lower your interest on other loans. Take a look at your investment portfolio and see what your interest rates are. What are you earning on a CD? What are you earning on your mutual fund? What are you earning on any stock that you have? If you could cash out a CD that is not performing very well, you could use that money to pay off a 5% interest rate loan that's costing you $500 a month in payment. That immediately increases cash flow, which could allow you to renegotiate interest rates on other loans as well, thereby freeing up even more cash flow beyond the $500 per month. Take this freed up cash and capitalize your cash flow insurance system. You can even consider extending loans to free up more cash flow and accelerate your cash flow insurance. This leads to more wealth long term more money in your life and in your pocket as well as added stability and options for you along the way. If you refinance your 15-year mortgage into a 30-year mortgage, you can take the payment that would normally go toward a 15-year mortgage and put it into your cash flow insurance policy. You'll find that in about 15 years, you'll have enough cash value to pay off the remainder of your mortgage. Then you can pay the rest of the mortgage payment you would have made back into your policy and end up with more money than either someone who had a 15 year mortgage or someone who had a 30 year mortgage but didn't take advantage of the cost difference, all with the possibility to be more tax efficient. You can also wrap a bunch of low cash flow index loans into your mortgage, thereby making the interest potentially tax deductible. The interest on many loans, like credit card interest and some car loan interest, is not tax deductible. The interest on a mortgage can be tax deductible in the United States depending on your income. So if you consolidate those other loans into your mortgage, you gain tax advantages while improving your cash flow. It's not just restructuring mortgages that can help free up cash flow. Say you have a vehicle that's been paid off. You could refinance it with a 1.9% or 3.5% interest rate and use that money to pay off a higher interest rate credit card. The car loan, an installment loan, is a better loan for your credit than a revolving loan like the credit card in which you pay money down and put money back on it at the same time because the revolving loan is an ongoing cycle while an installment loan is finite. The money you save can then be put into your cash flow insurance policy. If you can restructure your inefficient loans to have the lowest payments required with the best interest rates and tax advantages, you can free up thousands of dollars a month which can then go into your cash flow insurance system. When you free up cash flow, that cash can then go into your cash flow insurance. It's not costing you anything extra, it's just using the flows of your money more efficiently. 
Setting up a cash flow insurance policy also saves you from big costs like the cost of term insurance, which you no longer need when you have a permanent life insurance policy. The cost of term insurance might be two or three thousand dollars a year. Every year you don't die, that money is gone. The good news is you're alive. The bad news is that money is out of your hands. What could that money turn into? Just on its own, 3000 a year turns into 30000 over the next 10 years. If you've earned a few percentage points of interest, it's even more. By saving the cost of term insurance and putting that money into a cash flow insurance policy instead, you're keeping far more of your money and recapturing those costs. With this freed up cash flow and the proper policy, which means a policy that will give you early cash value with a company that has a strong dividend history and a long term track record, and with the proper design so you can put extra cash in right up to the tax benefit limit, you can start to enjoy the benefits of cash flow insurance.